As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. Tonight, our guest is a returning guest, Joel Salatin, co-founder of Polyface Farms, widely read author about local and sustainable food production, and speaker on many topics of the same area. Joel is here tonight to talk to us about his book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal, War Stories from the Local Food Front. Welcome back to Reluctant Preppers, Joel. Thank you. It's great to be with you again. Now, on your last visit here, you talked about the self-contained home and gave us some very practical tips that people can use to provide for themselves, for their family, in ways that make them uh, less dependent on systems outside their household and more self-reliant and self-sustainable. And tonight, we'd like to talk about your provocatively titled talk, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. Now, what in the world does that mean? (laughs) Well, what happens is that when you when you kind of go uh, go off the reservation, if you will, of of uh, orthodoxy in today's world, there's a host of uh, regulations to capture you. You know, it, it, um, it, if you if you build a solarium on your house, you know, it it's supposed to uh, pass a building code. If you um, you know, modify your house to a living roof. Goodness, if if you want to build a different kind of a house, you know, a straw bale house, uh, a yurt, uh, an underground house. I mean, anything that's unconventional um, will 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 uh, receive uh, a lot of extra scrutiny, and in many cases, you know, will be deemed actually um, uh, illegal. And and so there, you know, a lot of people don't realize how intrusive um, regulations are right now until until they embark on a um, on a, a self um, you know do it yourself self containment path because you know our our regulations encourage dependency on um, you know on the supermarket on you know just do what the government says you're supposed to do and your licenses and your compliance and, you know, all that stuff. But uh, if you're going to start, you know, keeping your water uh, at home and not put it down the the storm sewer, but actually use it to, you know, uh, grow things, if you're going to, you know, have uh, backyard chickens or whatever, um, you know, often these kinds of things run uh, run you counter to the official orthodoxy of the day, and that can be kind of uh, disheartening. And we've talked with that, and some of our guests who've been on the on the show, uh, actual uh, family members or uh, homesteaders who are trying to uh, make the transition from dependent, uh, sort of being in this just-in-time, uh, highly fragile uh, supply chain structure sure. that we live in, as what's considered conventional to people trying to be more more self-reliant, have run afoul of some of those things. We've had a, a fellow on here we, we uh, affectionately refer to as the guy next door who talked about uh, running into trouble with the city tra- from trying to raise chickens, trying to raise bees, and eventually having to move uh, out to the country. But if you could uh, tell us, when people want to make some of these changes, uh, but they don't want to move, what are some of the things that they can do in place to keep from running afoul of the law? Yeah, well, uh, I'm a, anybody that knows me knows that I'm a big believer of uh, it's a lot easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And so, uh, you know, let me just run down some things. I mean, let's, let's, let's take the chicken one. That's a, you kind of led with that. That's a good one to, to lead into. There's now um, a, a, uh, an underground, an underground uh, uh, chicken deal um, in which it, it's run by Pat Foreman, the author of the book City Chicks. And um, she will now um, let you have chickens that just come for a visit. What's interesting is all these ordinances all talk the, the the verbiage and all these or these prohibitions is about owning chickens. You know, you can't own chickens, blah blah blah. But what what she's contrived is visiting chickens. And so she has an organization, it's a non profit organization, in which you can call and uh you know, get two, three, four, five chickens, 
uh, and ask for a visit. And so you don't own them, uh, but the chickens are simply visiting. Now, they might visit for two years, but they're simply visiting. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a technicality, but you know as well as I do, th- th- this, is, this is the game, you know, this is the game we play. This is part of uh, what makes life so exciting is outsmarting the, you know, if, if the fox is the government, uh, we're in the hen house, so we want to we outfox that dude. And so, um, and so, you know, this is the kind of thing that, that, uh, that, that can be done. Um, uh, and, another- and in your in your book, you talk about other types of uh, sort of low profile uh, activities you can do, uh, either that just won't raise attention or that could be considered, uh, depending what you call them, uh, something that would be out would be within the boundaries. Yeah, well, for example, rabbits. You know, rabbits are kind of a a gray area because uh, because a lot of these laws make a pretty big distinction on pets. Well, rabbits. You know, rabbits are kind of cute and cuddly, and and they're they're very quiet. They don't excite attention, and um, and so a rabbit can almost be considered a, a pet. Of course, I realize people usually don't eat pets, but um, but why couldn't you eat a pet? Uh, I mean, some cultures eat cats and dogs, so you can you can join the tribe that you know eats its pet rabbits. Uh, you know, be be creative. You know, uh, be creative with these things. And so I'm a big believer in, uh, you know, in, in rabbits as a, as a protein source. Uh, but you can certainly do a lot of gardening. Uh, I mean, there's, there's no reason why uh, you can't grow plants. Edible landscaping is a, is a wonderful one. Um, where you, you act- now that's going to raise a red flag right away for people who have uh, like homeowners yeah. associations or whatever that, that specifically outlaw gardening. Yes. Um, Yes, and and those are are increasingly uh, problematic, and you know I, I would simply I would simply force the issue. Um, you know, I mean to, to to say that a rose a rose garden is fine, but a cucumber garden is not is certainly a a, a pretty splittable thing. And so I, I guess what I would encourage people to have is a is is just a little more rebellious streak in them. We 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 are cowed so often with, you know that 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 to be patriotic you have to be compliant. Well, you know the American patriots of 1776 were patriots because they were not compliant, and I think that uh, that we can, that you can get a lot of mileage in simply refusing to comply on some of these things, and and. Um, and 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 just you just don't advertise it, um, but to to grow a a fruit tree or a nut tree, um, you know rather than rather than a uh, a, a non edible tree um, is a is a great way to create this edible landscaping. It doesn't have to just be gardening. Um, you know, vermiculture. I mean, you can have a vermiculture bin under your kitchen sink. There are all sorts of cool uh, kits now made uh, for that. Aquaponics. I mean, uh, aquaponics you can have in your house. And, uh, and you know, in other words, these are things that you can do that nobody will see. You know, only your friends will see. Um, and and ac- there are aquaponic kits now that take about the same footprint in a house as a as a refrigerator. So, you know, if you're really a thinking person, you can throw out the TV, throw out the entertainment center. I mean, we don't have a, we don't have a TV in our house, and uh, just, it's a time waster anyway. So just throw that out and replace that footprint with an aquaponic setup, and you can uh, have your own, you can have fish, uh, you know, once a month, and, uh, and grow all of your own uh, mescaline mixed lettuces, and cabbages, and things like that, tomatoes. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of cool infrastructure that's been developed around that. Um, you know, it, it, think about, think about um, you know, kiddie pools. Uh, you know, there, there are prohibitions on, you know, uh, holding water, like especially in Colorado, you know, it's illegal to have a, a rain barrel. But, um, but a lot of people have, you know, backyard pools, so call your sister in a, a kiddie pool. You know, and and instead of having a fish pond, we'll call it a call it a kiddie pool. You know, a kiddie pool that we happen to have fish in. Um, there are you know there are all sorts of things. I was just in Australia lately, and 
and this guy is in a terrible uh, zoning situation. He's in an agriculture conservation zone, which prohibits him from being able to get this now. Can you imagine? So this is an entire you know region for agriculture conservation district, and he's prohibited from being able to sell anything from his farm on his farm. In other words, if I drive to his farm and want a cucumber, it's illegal for him to sell it to me because it's illegal for him to have a a retail um, a retail store on his own farm from his own produce. So what's interesting is he befriended several of the government agents and they they actually did want him to succeed. Fortunately, you know, he he had a he had an idea and a plan for this direct marketing and of course the local food system and tourism and all that. You know, he had a lot of he had a lot of of uh, people in his corner, the economic development people and the tourism people and all that. And so the regulator said, "Well, well okay, you can't have a retail store, but but the zoning doesn't say anything about a a um a regional distribution center. And so they just he now just calls this a regional dis, a farm product distribution center and since distribution center that phrase is not used in the zoning code he now has an on farm retail store fully sanctioned by the government but it's not called a retail store it's called an on farm distribution center and so you know i mean a thinking person laughs at this stuff but if you're on the receiving end of the of the uh, of, of the, the the Gestapo, you know the the um, compliance officer, these games are not. It's not funny, you know, when, when they flip open their badge and say, you know, you're now a criminal. Uh, that's not a fun thing to be in. So, you know, um, it, 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 it it's it's funny to talk about. It's not funny to go through. But I, I give this story just as a as a as an example of the kind of gymnastics that you can go through. You know, on our own farm, we need intern housing. Well, you know, we can't we can't have intern we can't have housing for employees, staff, or anybody here because we're in an agriculture district. And of course, you know, the environmentalists have decided that you know um, people on farms is not a good thing. And because farms are, you know, are, are America's playground, they're they're a green space, and green space we don't want, you know, populated with people or houses or domiciles. I mean, in California, um, a, a lot of areas you can't even build a house for a family member on a farm. I mean, I was out there, and there was a farm that that um, you know the 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 next generation wants to come and make a living on the farm. And uh, but 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 zoning only allows them to have one house, and so here you know mom and dad are in the one house allotted. Son and daughter-in-law and family want to come onto the farm and join them as full-time farmers, but they can't have a house there. And so these guys actually built a yurt, and and then they have a they have a series of connected yurts. Uh, I think three or four nice big yurts because yurts are not considered buildings. And so they live in a set of yurts that are all hooked together by, you know, uh, um, hallways under, and, and that enables them to live there without a, without a, a, a building permit. On our own farm, we ran into this, you know, with, with housing. And uh, so we found out that, that um, you know, in our county, you don't need a building permit if you if you live in a you know in a in an RV like you know if it's a portable structure or if it's a tree house or if it floats like if you have a farm pond you float a house on the farm pond there's no building permit required or a hunt camp and so uh, you know so our intern housing is, is the hunt camp the, the law doesn't say what you have to hunt of course it, they're assuming you're going to hunt wild game but it doesn't say you have to hunt wild game. And so, so we have a hunt camp for our interns. We call it, and and uh, and they're simply hunting for the truth. <laughs> so you know, I, I think I think that that the key here, and, and my encouragement to folks is to realize that there are there are tons of really cool um, workarounds on a lot of these things, 
And and um, if you can if you can just think creatively and look at and look at what the code doesn't explicitly say, um, you might be surprised uh, as to as to what you can get by with. Now, you also mentioned uh, certain types of sort of low-profile vegetable gardening. Can you talk to us about how, how that can be disguised as something that doesn't look like a garden at all? Well, yeah. You know, there are wonderful uh, um, stackable uh, stacking garden kits now for urban, especially urban gardening, where, you know, um, where instead of having a clematis, for example, climbing up a, a latticework on your porch, uh, instead you have these little... Um, boxes with compost in them. The plants all cascade out the sides, sides, and it looks exactly like some sort of a, you know, a, a trellised vine or, or whatever. Uh, but in, but it's actually all edible, and it's and it's you know it it can go up ten feet tall. Um, there was a guy in uh, Kenya actually, uh, I think that's where he was. He had a very limited space, so he went down and got a bunch of old. Um, used like 24 inch uh, corrugated culverts and he took a torch and and heated the edges and knocked uh, pockets in the side of them with a you know made them red hot and then whacked them with a hammer and made made pockets he filled them up with compost and um and then dripped water in the top and he planted cabbage these things were 12 feet tall and the cabbages all grew, you know, out of the culverts, and he had the equivalent. I think it was something like 25 acres of cabbages. He was growing them in one acre in these vertical, you know, these vertical tubes. And so, um, don't call it, the, you know, it, it's not a tube. It's a, you know, it. it you could call it the ultimate. Um, you know, we've got YouTube on the internet. Uh, call it a. Uh, call it a food tube, call it a, a, a an F tube, or call it, you know, anyway, um, it, it's not a garden, you know, uh, and, and, and let the other side, let the other side go through the gymnastics of, of telling you that you can't grow food for yourself. I mean, that's where we've got to come to. I mean, Henry David Thoreau, big on civil disobedience, and, 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 and to, to live in this country and not have the freedom to grow your own food is just, um, it's un-American, it's, it's, it's inhuman, it's, it's ridiculous. And, um, and, and so don't call it a garden. Call it a, call it a, a, a food bin, a food tube, a food, um, you know, call it, call it, uh, call it a sculpture, call it a, a food sculpture. You know, if, 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 you took, if you took a great big watermelon and carved it up with a knife. Uh, nobody would nobody would argue with you your ability to uh, freedom of expression. You know, you're expressing yourself through a, a watermelon sculpture. Well, um, this is this is an art an art form. You know, uh, uh, a a plant a plant sculpture, a plant art form. You know, it, it's. Uh, yeah, you talked about the mental gymnastics uh, that people have to go through to, to try to convince you that something as basic as growing your own food through gardening is unpatriotic. My folks who lived through the Second World War talked about the patriotism of that was promoted then as of raising a victory garden. So there, there was deemed patriotic to raise a garden to alleviate the, the, the pressure to feed the nation. And here it's been turned, around, yeah. turned upside down and backwards by our, our politically correct modern era. Yeah, and I, I think I think what this the, the the background or the foundation of all this kind of anti uh, food pro- integrated food production uh, thinking is really an extremely elitist. Um, it's an extremely elitist idea that an intellectual elitism that simply rejects as uh, as backward hillbilly um, you know redneck. Uh, uh, intellectually disadvantaged anyone who would who would dare put their hands in the soil. You know that that's for that's for brown people. That's for that's for those kind of people. And it, it's an incredibly um, uh, you know condescending uh, spirit attitude to look with this kind of. Uh, 
Well, disdain, yeah. Disdain, that's, that's, a good, that's the right word. Look at this kind of disdain on people who, who want to be self-reliant, who want to uh, opt out of a lot of things and be resilient. Uh, that that's absolutely true, and so uh, and and I think that that when you when you push that envelope, it, it becomes very very apparent exactly what it is that it really is a, um, a, an elitist uh, idea. Yeah, it becomes uh, more apparent on which side of the argument common sense resides, right. and from which it's lacking. Uh, I'm glad you brought up integrated. Uh, growing practices, and can you talk, because I know that's one of the things that you specialize in, can you give us some examples of some things that go together from a permaculture or integrated stance that people can do on a very small scale? Oh, yeah, there are a lot of symbiosis uh, things, I mean, and and remember that there is no animal-less ecosystem, so um, so animals Animals and plants have a symbiotic synergistic effect, and of course, anyone who gardens, anyone who grows anything knows that manure is manure is magic. I mean, it doesn't matter uh, where it comes from, uh, except except for dogs and cats. Uh, that's not magic; that's hazardous material. But when you talk about you know farm animals, manure is absolutely magic, including you know including humans, and so. What you're trying to do here is integrate, uh, is have a very inter- intricate relational integration of things. So uh, if you take your kitchen scraps, feed them to your handful of chickens, and take the manure from the chickens to side dress your vegetables, rabbits, the same thing. Rabbit, rabbit manure is like horse manure, it's real, it's real cold, it's not, not hot like chicken manure, so it doesn't burn things. So you can actually go out to you know, Swiss chard and kale and things, and, and um, uh, you can actually side dress it straight with raw rabbit manure, and it's quite, you know, it's, it's quite acceptable. Um, and and so, you, so you fundamentally integrate. Then, of course, another permaculture concept, of course, is, um, is stacking. So that you have, for example, you know, we grow rabbits above chicken. So, so chickens are up above, rabbits, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, rabbits are up above, chickens are below, chickens are scratching through what the rabbits drop, making the best compost in the world. Compost with more, more species of manure in it is better than one species. So rabbit chicken manure uh, uh, as, a, as, a, you know, as a nitrogen source for uh, compost is even better than just one. So this this deep bedding under the animals then makes you know you're just feeding it with your carbon. You're raking your leaves and things. And many people live next to neighbors. The city's picking up their leaves. Man, go go get those leaves. Don't let those get away. Those leaves are carbon. They can mulch your you know mulch your garden space. Um, be bedding under your you know under your animals, and um, and that that'll be your carbon source for all of your for all of your production. And then. You know, then then you can go on up. You know, you can have uh, uh, grapevines, for example, uh, are beautiful. They they go up, and then above the grapevines, you can have nut and apple trees, or you know, or some kind of fruit trees. And we have uh, mulberries and uh, pawpaws and pears and apples and plums, and and you can run. You know, you can run poultry. You can run. Uh, rabbits under them. You can run grapevines because all those fruiting nut type trees have what's called a, a, a fairly uh, a mottled a, a mottled canopy. It's not an opaque canopy. Uh, a poplar, hickory, uh, that or shagbark hickory. You know, that'll have a real opaque canopy. But you know, many of your most of your your domestic you know fruit trees have a pretty open canopy and so things can grow underneath them uh, you know you can you can space out your grapevines and even grow vegetables uh, between your grapevines you don't have to mow that uh, you know get rid of the mower and you can mow with the animals you can mow you, you, you can turn all that space into um, you know into vegetables and do a rotation you know where a, you know one year it's vegetables and then you have two years of running uh, chickens and rabbits say down through it and then turn it back in the garden and uh, I'm sorry into uh, food sculpture and and you you, you simply um, 
uh, you know, use the vertical space. Um, I'm a huge believer in solariums. On, on the edge, I mean, every single house should have a solarium on it, uh, and and the solarium will give you passive heat in the winter, and it will allow you to grow cold hardy stuff in the in the um, winter as well. Uh, so you're growing vegetables in the winter time, especially lettuces and cabbages and you know uh, beets and carrots, things that are cold hardy. Grow that in the winter time. And then uh, during the day, the sun comes out, and you open your windows, and you have passive solar heat into your house. And um, our, most of our winds here in North America come kind of out of the southwest. So a solarium on the southern side uh, gives you a, 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 a second wind break ante room, which cuts your, cuts your you know, cost way down. You, um, you, know, you can go to a living roof. You can have a beehive up on the roof and some, and some vegetables. You hook up your exercise bicycle to your kiddie pool uh, roof guttering uh, runoff cistern. Uh, we'll call it the kiddie pool. And, um, and your exercise bike can pump that water back up on the roof to a drip irrigation deal. And, um, and you know, if you have a living roof, uh, it's now suddenly you don't have to have any air conditioner in the summertime because the transpiration of the plants creates a thermally, a, a cool zone around your house. The cucumbers cascade over down over the side of the house. You go to the second floor and pick cucumbers, you know, off the cascading vines, and it cools your house out, so now you don't have to have an air conditioner. And so if you, if you suddenly become water independent, energy independent, and food independent, and your and your and your house and your don't you know if it's paid for, uh, you know you you can uh, you can live really really cheaply, and um, and not not be very dependent on a lot of things. It it it's really cool to be able to uh, you know to be that self reliant on a on a very small place. Yeah, it sounds like combining a lot of those synergies can really help people to um, avoid needing the need for uh, streams of income that they would other have to do use to rely on outside systems, outside their family. And back on that small scale again, you mentioned earlier uh, sort of the humorous uh, anecdote of the your acquaintance in Australia who opened a regional distribution center. So for people who live on a in a very difficult suburban situation uh, where they really can't do any kind of uh, outright selling of anything that they would raise. Um, what are some creative ways that you've recommended that people consider uh, to be able to to uh, get some additional value beyond what they can consume directly from what they raise? Sure. Well, you know, a lot of places have you know business prohibitions and things like that. You would not believe how many people I've seen run a donation kind of thing. Uh, just put an honor box out there. Yeah. Once in a while, somebody will come and and take and not give very much. Uh, but other people will be exceptionally generous and be, uh, you know, and compensate for the folks that are a little bit stingy. And, you know, you're not running a, you know, if you're not, if you're not selling anything, you're not running a business. Uh, you're just running a, uh, you know, a charity. And um, the last time I checked, you know, normally you can, you can give things away. And so, of course, it'll you know it'll drive the regulators nuts because they'll try to you know say that you're running a business blah, 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 and all that. But uh, but if you're if you're not if you're not into commerce, if you're not selling, uh, believe me, you don't have a business uh, because it's in commerce uh, where the transaction of money is that you know that you get stuck. Um, you can you you can you can um, form a private club. Uh, there's a really good operating one in uh, Louisville, Kentucky right now uh, where people join a private club. And so food is not in commerce. And the only way they can get it is to join the club. The, the secret to that is to prepay. And if you're wanting more information, I would encourage people to go to the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund website, and, uh, and, and, and join, and then you can get you know, you can get templates on how to create these private clubs so that the food does not go into commerce. And this one is large with, you know, lots of families and they're selling everything illegal. You can imagine, you know, homemade cheese and soft cheeses and, and raw milk and, 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 uh, you know, uninspected beef jerky and bologna. I mean, all the good stuff. 
and the government can't touch them because it's not being sold. It's it's a private club like a country club. The public's not in, not allowed to come in, and uh, and so you know these are these are ways around. You can you can sell something and 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 um, and, and give something else away. I mean, like a, a goat farmer that. Um, sold their goat manure for uh, $8 a, a gallon, and then if you bought a gallon of goat manure, you gave, they, 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 they gave you a gallon of milk. And um, so, you know, there are, there are schemes like that. And um, I, just, I just think that if we, if we put our heads together and um, try to, you know, try to come up with these um, other other options um if, if we worked it hard as hard at at uh, creatively making a gorilla run around around compliance um instead of trying to figure out how to come up with the money and actually comply per their you know requirements uh we'd probably get along a lot better we'd probably be a lot farther along with what we want to do it sounds like that's one of your uh, greatest lessons that kind of runs through everything you've said, is, and that's don't be overly impressed with the letter of the law and the uh, intimidating tone or, or to be cowed into submission, but just just take a deep breath and think more common sense thoughts and, and, and try to find a way that uh, makes sense to you and that won't necessarily uh, raise a lot of attention and think of something thing you're going to call it that's different and uh, find ways to uh, just be creative and t- that way it's just staying off the radar and staying out of out of the, the uh, regulatory uh, running a follow of regulators yes and 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 don't be afraid um, you know don't be afraid to tell a regulator um, you know we're not gonna we're not gonna talk we're gonna talk via mail you know um, this is this is my first thing that I counsel people when they get in these ticklish situations is is don't talk to the bureaucrat because the bureaucrats uh, they're not obligated to anything that they say they are obligated if they put it in writing and making them put it in writing will will buy you a year of of uh, of time because they don't want to put it in writing and so. Um, and so, you know, I, when they want to come out and, and whatever, see, I, I don't let them out of the car. I, you know, nope, you can't, you can't come here. Uh, you have to, you have to get a warrant, and you have to, um, and you have to talk to me in writing. We don't, we don't talk, we don't talk, um, we don't have conversation. Uh, we're going to talk in writing. Suddenly, suddenly they have to, they have to, you know, back up and think. And, and they can't just come in like they do willy nilly. Because here's what I've found is lots of times they actually don't know what the law it says. But the easiest thing for them to do is just say no. I mean that's the that's the default position. Just say no, uh, and, and then you know then as a bureaucrat nobody's going to call me on the carpet uh, because I got creative, you know, with somebody. Uh, you know, perish the thought that I would become creative with somebody and help them try to figure out how to solve their problem. Um, just just uh, uh, requiring your communication in writing will make them think long and hard about what they're going to say. And then you have, then you have something that's a matter of a public record. Then, then if it's something that's just totally ridiculous, you can find it in the, in the, you know, call the newspaper, you know, now look, look at the, Ridiculous, you know. I mean, I've had, I've had, for example, food police here in the state look at me, and uh, I have a, in writing, actually written, written testimony, um, where in letters where they said that we can't allow consumers to choose their food because they're too ignorant. Now, <laughs> when when you you know when that that's in other words that's in writing okay in writing and when you put that in the public sphere in the media and you name the person and you put that kind of statement with their name the, the public goes apoplectic I mean even as 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 whatever dumbed down ridiculous and idiotic as our country is right now still that kind of statement resonates with people as being 
you know, that, that ain't right. It, it, you know, it, 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 we shouldn't we shouldn't be at that point. That's and, right. Uh, and, and, and you know, even you know, even socialists um, kind of take a bit of a backward uh, a back uh, glance when they read that consumers are too stupid to make to to choose their food. I mean, that's going pretty far. And so, and, and so, uh, writing gives you a place, a public record. It slows the system down, slows the system down to give you wiggle room, breathing room, time to uh, think creatively, take a breath, get some friends together, uh, and 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 you know, and carve out some wiggle room. That's good advice for all of us uh, who are looking at ways of uh, taking better care of our families and wondering how to do that uh, despite some of the constraints or apparent constraints we may be facing. And uh, we wanted to have you back in the future to talk about another one of your topics, which is equally uh, provocative, uh, called Folks, This Ain't Normal, a farmer's advice for happier hens, healthier people, and a better world. So uh, just thank you very much, uh, Joel, for being here with us and joining us on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you. It's been uh, been my privilege.